Welcome, folks, on this Good Friday, 2021. This is really act three of a four-act play, and so today there may be an unfinished feel to what's happening today. There won't be any benediction because the story's not over. Today is Good Friday, the day when we remember the crucifixion of Jesus and the things and the reasons that led up to it. And would you begin today by joining me in an opening prayer. Once again, O God, we come together to hear the story anew and to have your word speak to our hearts and minds. And as we do so, we pray that you will soften our hearts and, our, and open our minds so that our hearing and our following the way of the cross may go deeper. We ask this in Christ's name and for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Were you there when they crucified? begin today by reading you two parts of the story of leading up to Good Friday from the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 8 is the first piece, verses 27 through 33. 
Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered right away, you're the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anybody about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke very plainly to them about this. Peter took him aside and he began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You don't have your mind in your mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So that's the first reading. The second reading is a little closer to the Good Friday events. Mark chapter 14, verses 66 through 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You, you also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and he went out into the entryway. When the girl, servant girl saw him standing there, she said again to those standing around, you know, this fellow is one of them, and again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near Peter said to him, surely you're one of them for your accent. It's like, it's a Galilean accent. And he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you're talking about. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. And then Peter remembered the words of Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Through the readings of these scripture, may you hear the word of God. So I'd like you to lose, use your imagination a little bit right now. I'm going to try to get into the character of Peter a little bit and just picture him sort of not around the fire in the courtyard in, in the wee hours of the morning, but off to one side, maybe just as a chance to kind of talk to you folks here today. So let's begin. Good afternoon. My name is Peter, and I want to tell you I'm really confused. Actually, I don't know what I feel. Some of it's shock, a lot of it's fear, shame, anger. And angry both at Jesus and myself is just all mixed up. It's hard to separate it out. But mostly, you know, I am just so sad. My heart aches. Have you got a few moments, folks? Uh, I just need someone to talk a little bit to to kind of get this out. I really need to kind of understand how this happened and how I could have been so blind and so stupid. I should have just followed Jesus, stuck right with him as my master and my friend, the best person I ever knew. But I didn't do that. I told him I'd die for him and I ended up denying that I even knew him. Three times. Now, I hate Judas for betraying Jesus, but you know what? I'm really not that much better. And right now, I'm kind of hiding over here with you in the corner, and Jesus is in there with the chief priest being tortured or interrogated in their kangaroo court, and he's probably gonna end up being killed. And I'm party, probably part of it. I am a worm, a coward, not a man. 
But why didn't I see this coming? When I think back over the last six months, Jesus gave us all plenty of clues that he wasn't who we thought he was, who we wanted him to be. He told us about that time he was in the desert right after his baptism when Satan tempted him to have power like Caesar, rule over all the world. And Jesus said, nope, don't want that. And we, we didn't want him to worship Satan in exchange for anything, but, but we sure wanted him to defeat Caesar and have enough power to do that. You know, kind of to be like King David of old, like he would have done and reestablish our nation of Israel. He talked about the kingdom of God all the time. And when we heard that, you know, in our ears, we thought kingdom of Israel, that's the kingdom of God. No. You just heard in the reading a few moments ago that, that you folks had, were listening to about how he, he asked people who they thought he was and who we thought he was. I knew he was the anointed one. I knew he was the Christ, the Messiah. And, and he thought, I thought he'd be pleased, for me with, pleased with me for saying that. But instead, he called himself the son of man, the human one, and, and a prophet. And he started talking about death. Can you imagine? He started talking about death. I tried to stop him talking that way, and he turned on me. He called me Satan. Oh, it was so embarrassing. I was only trying to help the cause, you know? I mean, if you're going to raise an army, you can't talk about death and defeat. So I thought I knew who Jesus was, even if he didn't know himself. Everyone knew. Everyone's theology was that the Messiah would be like King David and he'd rise up and drive those Roman out of Israel and back into the sea, just the same way as Jesus did with those legion demons into the pigs going back into the sea. You know, that was our vision for who Jesus was. Even last night, when the soldiers came to get him, I used my sword to cut off the ear of one of the high priest's henchmen. You know, and you know what Jesus did? He took it and he healed it. He put it back on and healed it. I, I, I'm just so confused. I thought this nonviolence thing was a temporary strategy, but that when push came to shove, he would want us to shove back. Doesn't seem to be the case. Did I ever really understand him? Was I blinded by my theology? No, I'm just not sure anymore of why all this happened. Oh, I, I gotta go. Thanks for listening to me. Remember, this is just between us. I'm still really confused and I'm certainly still afraid. Maybe I'll see you later.
Jesus, man of sorrows, Jesus, Prince of Peace, on the cross he suffered for our sins release, bearing all our burdens, So, every year, as we retell the story of Christ's passion and death, I find that a different part of this story stands out for me. I'm glad we do this every year because, like going through a well-worn path, it gets a little bit deeper each year. This year, I was thinking about what I felt, what the feelings of Good Friday would, would have been about, and for me, a couple of the ones that stand out the most are the feelings of Jesus and how he must have felt both frustration and sadness. The following reading from the Gospel of John helps tell you why I think those things. John chapter 18, 33 to 38. Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews then? Jesus said, is that your own idea or did others tell you about me? <laughs> Am I a Jew, he replied? Your own people, the chief priests, handed you over to me. What, do you, what have you done? Jesus said, well, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Ah, said Pilate, so you are a king then. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. <laughs> what is truth, retorted Pilate. And with this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I can't find any reason to condemn this man. I can't find any reason to lay any charges against him. Thus ends the reading. But in this reading, you will have noticed that Jesus says why he's come, which is to bear testimony to the truth. And of course, that's what the prophets were doing all throughout the Jewish history, bearing testimony to the truth that God couldn't get them to even, you know, they wouldn't be able to stop proclaiming it even if they want. The prophet Jeremiah used to say, a curse on the day I was born because God seemed to put words into his mouth that he couldn't keep in there, you know. And yet, though Jesus says he's come to bear testimony to the truth, all the gospels seem to be in agreement that few, if any, maybe a few of the women, but his own disciples even, didn't understand what he was trying to say and what he was trying to do. Like Peter, they just didn't understand. They didn't comprehend the things, you know, of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. They didn't understand his mission, what he was about. And that must have been frustrating and eventually really sad for Jesus. The Gospel of John, where that passage I just read you from, is from, more than any other gospel suggests that friend and foe alike are blinded by belief 
or lack of belief or wrong belief, be those beliefs religious or political. And thus, everybody seemed to just refuse to acknowledge the truth that was staring them in the face. Think of the Pharisees. The, uh, Jesus, you couldn't have healed blind Bartimaeus with the power of God because Jesus, you're a sinner, you break the law. And because you're a sinner, you can't have the power. It must have been somebody else that healed him. You, you know, that can't be the truth. The rich young ruler thought that he'd kept all of the commandments perfectly, but he didn't want to hear that the wealth, his wealth, in the face of starvation all around him was a sin, and so he walked away. Neither the crowds nor the disciples would accept that Jesus wasn't the political and the military Messiah like King David that they expected, despite the fact that he told them over and over and over again, that's not who he was. He even came riding into Jerusalem last Sunday on a donkey, not a horse, not a chariot, no arms, and yet they still didn't get it. Jesus was so frustrated, he would often say, dig the wax out of your ears, listen, listen to what I'm saying, frustration. All of these folks had alternative facts or explanations and refused to really see and hear Jesus because they had preconceived ideas and assumptions that helped them make sense of their world and Jesus just didn't fit in there rightly. In the past little while, you and I have seen probably more than any other time in our lifetime about how truth masquerading, or lies masquerading as truth gets supported by religion and just seem to blind people to what's really happening. So my challenge to you all this Good Friday is a question. How about you and I? Do we really understand the truth that Jesus was trying to communicate, even to the point of going to the cross for it? You know? Are we too blinded by our assumptions and our preconceived theologies and thinking? Our theology of the cross, the thing, the understanding of this day that we've grown up with since the time we were little, has it been a way of seeing things more clearly or has it been something that's kind of clouded the truth from our eyes, you know? Religion and theology always has had two sides to it. On the one hand, it can be used to help us see things more clearly, to bring good news to the poor and the oppressed and be helpful in that process of social and political change and personal change. It can help us see ourselves and the world more clearly. But on the other hand, religion and beliefs and theology can be used to blind and distract us from the cruel realities of life and our call to discipleship, from following Jesus and seeking justice and resisting evil, from acknowledging that God, rather than any other king or country or human authority, has real authority over us, from refusing to accept nonviolence as the only real lasting way of peace. When you think of it, neither Jesus nor his followers raised any arms against those who were hurting them even. Wow. Commitment to nonviolence, you better believe it. So how do you understand the death of Jesus on the cross? For you, is he just a sacrificial lamb, our ticket to forgiveness and heaven? Or is he the prophet he claimed to be with a very earthly significance? speaking truth to power and exposing the denial and lies that keep us from acting for real change. If Jesus was willing to die as a prophet for the truth, can't we just take a little bit of time on this Good Friday to actually think about that and to think about what really brought him to that cross? Amen.
Finally today, would you pray with me a closing prayer? God of Jesus, God who brings good news to the poor, God of us all and all creation, we who live after both Good Friday and Easter have the potential of hearing and understanding the truth that Jesus was really trying to say and communicate. Because he was even willing to be executed as a revolutionary on a Roman cross, help us to look more deeply and to think again about what all this means and why it came to this. Help us to relieve the frustration and sadness of Jesus by truly hearing and seeing what he was saying and doing. Help us to know his truth. We ask this in the name and for the sake of the kingdom he died proclaiming. Amen. Yeah.